unido, jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido, jamás será vencido. Hay un Marcus, hay Frankivalidus, el fruto de fe, el Sigeridus, el Schengen, sabréis a seguir, podréis a un fel. Welcome to the award ceremony for the Arthur Svensson International Prize for Trade Union Rights. My name is Espen Löken. This is the twelfth time the prize is awarded. Every time we have had a ceremony in Oslo, but because of the pandemic we had to cancel the ceremony last year, and this year we had to do a digital ceremony as traveling and social gathering is difficult. We really look forward to meet physically next year. The choir Socialistisk Kor opened this ceremony with a song from Chile, El Pueblo Unido. The song was initially composed as an anthem for the popular unity government, reflecting the spirit behind the mass mobilization of working class people who in 1970 elected Salvador Allende and later became the anthem of the Chilean resistance against the Pinochet regime. With the members of the choir on separate balconies but still together, it could stand as a symbol on how we have lived and acted the last one and a half years. But it can also serve as a special honor to last year's prize winner, the trade union leader from Chile, Barbara Figueroa, for whom we had to cancel the ceremony. We were very sorry for not being able to honor her the same way as we used to do. Together, we will honor this year's winner, the independent trade unions of Belarus that have especially fought a hard battle the last year against a dictatorship that has attacked all forms of opposition, including the independent trade unions. We hope we have put together an interesting program for you. Besides the speech by the leader of the Arthur Svensson Prize Committee, we will, among others, have conversations 
with representatives from the global trade unions, from the Belarus unions, and we will have a conversation with worker representatives and the CEO of Yara, a company doing business in Belarus. First of all, let us hear what the Price Committee leader Frode Alfheim from the Norwegian Union Industri Energi has to say as a justification for this year's award. Dear friends and comrades, my name is Frod Alfheim. I am president of the Union Industri Energi and I am honored to represent the Arthur Svensson International Prize for Trade Union Rights Committee. This committee represents a wider national and international trade union movement. Today is the 12th time uh, the prize is awarded. The prize is presented to a person or organization that has worked predominantly to promote trade union rights and or strengthen trade union organizing around the world. And during these years, the prize has been awarded to trade union heroes from all continents. The first one was Wellington Shibebe from Zimbabwe. Thereafter, strong trade in unionists like Shaher Sa'i from Palestine, Valentin Urusov from Russia, Napoleon Gomez Urucha from Mexico, Mahdi Abu Deb, and Yalaila Al Salman from Bahrain. France Castro from the Philippines and Barbara Figueroa from Chile. Also, organizations have received the award, the first being the Textile Workers Union, Kavdu, in Cambodia, later the Union for Workers at South African Vineyards, Kasavu, and the Independent Trade Unions of Kazakhstan, as well as the campaigning organization Labour Start. Common for all these prize winners is that they have fought for basic trade union rights and to organize workers under harsh condition. Several of the countries where they come from are on the ITUC list of the 10 worst countries in the world for workers. The prize is named after the Norwegian trade union legend Arthur Svensson. Arthur was the president of the Norwegian Union of Chemical Industry Workers for 17 years. He made a great impression on Norwegian society and was very involved in all the international stages. This year, the prize once again is awarded to the independent trade unions in one of the worst countries for workers, according to the ITUC. On behalf of the prize committee, I congratulate the independent trade unions of Belarus, represented by the Belarusian Congress of Demo Democratic Trade Unions, BKDP and its affiliates, which this year's award. They received the award for their fearless struggle for democracy and fundamental trade union rights in Europe's last dictatorship. We are proud to have you amongst our laureates. Last year, the trade union leader Barbara Figueroa from Cut, Chile, received the prize. We are very sorry that we were not able to honor Barbara the way we used to do by inviting her to a ceremony in Oslo because of the pandemic. Barbara and Kurt have had success the last year by being part of the strong force that made it possible to elect a constitution congress that will change the constitution of Chile to the better for the workers. We congratulate Barbara with that. Together, we have also had a project aiming to train young workers, especially women, to become trade union activists, which will contribute to strengthen the unions in Chile. A strong bond exists between organized workers. It is a sense of solidarity that would be hard to describe to those who have never experienced it. A bond that is hard to understand for those who have never been part of the struggle and never stood up for the rights of others. It is a kind of solidarity that does not distinguish between industries, that does not know color, sexual orientation or religion, and does not stop at any border. 
The solidarity between workers can be felt from the mines in Mexico and Russia to vineyards in South Africa, from the oil rigs of Kazakhstan and textile factories in Gambodja to the classrooms in Bahrain and in the Philippines, in Chile and in Belarus. What the independent trade unions in Belarus have in common with our other laureates is that they have organized strikes, protests, and they have for years stood in the front of the fight for decent wages, working condition, and welfare for workers. According to the International Trade Union Confederation, Belarus is today among the 10 worst countries in the world for workers and trade unionists. Let us watch a short video which gives an impression of the situation in Belarus. Across the country, workers went on strike, adding their voices to the swelling protest movement. Thousands upon thousands willing to risk their jobs. 20 people decided to speak their mind, just abandoned their work and left. Their boss said, fine, go on. I have enough other people who will take your wages. These striking workers from a Minsk tractor factory were unimpressed. Their placard reads, we are not 20, we are 16,000. Many emerged from custody with injuries and tales of police brutality. We are against violence. We are for peace and transparent and fair elections. We want new authorities. People are tired of waiting. 26 years of lawlessness, rudeness, insults and lies. Authorities stood by as huge crowds again assembled in Minsk on Friday evening, and some were rewarded. Moments of humanity between those demanding change and those representing the power of the state. Human rights rights organizations have for many years expressed deep concern about the human rights violations in the country, disappearances, police violence, and lack of freedom of expression and association. Despite the Lukashenko regime's attempt to take control of the independent trade unions and complicate recruitment, organizing, and regular trade union activities, they have never given up and have continued to work for their members. In connection with the presidential election in the autumn of 2020, where the result was obviously falsified, the situation in the country deteriorated further. All forms of opposition have been cracked down on through heavy police brutality, imprisonment and harassment. The independent trade union movement early became essential in the fight against the falsification of the election result and fight for democracy. There was a wave of strikes, actions and demonstrations demanding the cancellation of the election result and the release of all political prisoners. The strikes and demonstrations were met with terror, mass arrests and torture. A number of trade union representatives and activists have been fired from their jobs and many have been imprisoned or forced to flee the country. Union officers have been raided and closed. Nevertheless, the unions in the BKDP have recruited new members, formed new local unions and continued the struggle. This will be crucial for the Lukashenko regime to fall in the end. The Price Committee will state that in shaping a new political and economic regime after the fall of Lukashenko, a vibrant trade union movement, independent of political authorities, will be crucial in creating a society that serves the vast majority. Dear Alexander Yaroshuk and all other comrades in Belarus, we are deeply impressed by your courage and honored to stand by you. Today, we are not only celebrating the working people and awarding the Arthur Svensson Prize, we are also making the world smaller. 
Our movement is an international movement and leaders of all countries and all businesses must know that we are also a movement of solidarity. An injustice to workers in Belarus is an injustice to all workers of all nationalities and of all industries and trades. The Arthur Svensson Award is a reminder that no workers should stand alone. For every year that passes, our eyes are open to new struggles and to new injustice done to working people. The annual reports from the International Confederation of Trade Unions show that it is getting tougher for workers in almost every part of the world. Free speech is being limited, attacks on union members are increasing, the right to strike is being restricted, and more workers are being denied the basic right to form and join unions. The crackdown on union rights is not a national, but a global phenomen phenomenon. We see it in all parts of the world. Our struggles reminds us what is on stake. But it, it is also a reminder to us in Norway that we live in a country that gives us the right to fight for our rights, a right that is essential part of any democracy. For us, the right is not only a privilege, but an obligation. We must use our freedom to stand up for the freedom of others. That is what the spirit of Arthur Svensson is about. Labor rights are fundamental human rights. You cannot choose to follow these standards only when it suits you. They are not rights preserved for speeches and the rhetoric of dip diplomacy. On the contrary, labor rights together with other human rights from the very core of a civilized society. We are outraged when the freedom to organize is broken. We expect it to be respected. And it, is it not respected until all workers can form and join unions without consequences, without fear and without government persecution. Our message to the authorities of Belarus is that we will not rest until trade unions are respected, as well as their leaders and members. When I look back on the list of laureates of the Svensson Award, it makes me proud. It makes me proud to think about the personalities and the organization that we have had the pleasure to get to know during these 10 years. It is with great admir admiration I recognize the differences they have made for working people all over the world. When I look at the struggles of the independent unions in Belarus, the pride for this award and the commitment of international solidarity grows even stronger. You stand up against great forces and your struggle continues. You have shown solidarity and strength even when being attacked by superior forces. You have been a beacon of freedom in a region that is far from free. You are a defender of human rights and labor rights. For this, we honor you with the Arthur Svensson International Prize for Trade Union Rights. Congratulations to the independent trade unions in Belarus. We will also have a greeting from the International Trade Union Confederation, ITUC, by their General Secretary, Sharon Burrow. Congratulations, Brother Yaroshok, and all of the members and activists and leaders of the BKDP. There is no doubt your courage has stood for democratic rights and freedoms in Belarus for more than 25 years. Your courage is well known and indeed uh, has inspired many, many others in the face of authoritarianism and oppression. You also, of course, since last August, have stood together on the front lines of the fight for democracy, when indeed, again, democratic uh, hope was stripped away from people with uh, a dubious election outcome. We've seen the persecution, the arrests, the oppression, the violence that has ensued on the streets of Belarus. But not once has the union walked away from an ongoing struggle to see peace, democracy and rights established 
in your country so that your children and grandchildren can live in freedom. This prize is so well deserved. We were proud to nominate you. We thank the Norwegian uh, energy unions that established this prize, the Arthur Svensson Award, indeed honouring a great person, a great union hero. But we want to acknowledge, Brother Yaroshok, that you and the union are indeed heroes and indeed in inspiration for the courage of a movement that will never stop fighting for democracy, for rights, for freedoms. I salute you. We will try to call up the people from the prize winner BKDP, but first I give you their president, Alexander Yaroshuk. Дорогие друзья, мы очень признательны вам, наши норвежские коллеги, за самую высокую в международном процессовом движении награду – премию имени выдающегося лидера норвежского процессового движения Артура Свенсона. К этой награде приложили свои усилия, внесли свой вклад несколько поколений членов независимых профсоюзов. Прежде всего, это те люди, которые стояли у истоков создания независимого профсоюзного движения еще в конце 80-х, начале 90-х годов. Можете представить, насколько им было непросто. В советское время не было традиций функционирования настоящих профсоюзов. И в советское время, и в современной Беларуси профсоюзы выполняли функции по обслуживанию специфических утилитарных интересов действующей власти. И только небольшая горстка людей в начале 90-х годов, которая создала и первые независимые профсоюзы, и в 93 году создала Белорусский конгресс демократических профсоюзов, шла своей дорогой, несла знамя независимого профсоюзного движения, идеалов и принципов, независимости профсоюзов. И можно себе представить, какой трудной была эта дорога. Но мы прошли этот путь, мы достойно справились со своей миссией, которая выпала на нашу долю не только защищать права и интересы своих членов, но и всех трудящихся нашей страны. Поэтому мы чрезвычайно горды тем, что нам присуждена столь высокая награда. Вместе с тем мы отдаем себе отчет, что пока наша борьба за свободу и демократию, за то, чтобы принести свободу и трудящимся нашей страны, не завершилась успехом. И то дело, которое было начато в августе прошлого года, когда многие-многие наши члены, вышли на стачки и забастовки, боролись за то, чтобы в стране наступили перемены, чтобы в конечном итоге мы стали жить в условиях демократии, пока еще мы победы не достигли. Но хочу вас заверить, что мы обязательно это сделаем и оправдаем эту награду, которую мы сегодня считаем пока еще только авансом. Живе Беларусь! If the luck is with us, we have now representatives of the independent trade unions in Belarus with us. I can see Alexander Yaroshuk and I can see uh, Oleg, the international secretary. Hello, how are you? Uh, Oleg, will you present the other comrades for us? I, I'm ready to introduce all of us, okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so on, on my right, this lady on my right, is, her name is Yelena Yeskova. She is a national lawyer working for the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions. Behind me, another lady, Irina. 
She is responsible for information activities in the Congress. So next one on, the, on my left is Alexander Yeroshuk, president of the KDP. Next one to the left is uh, Alexander Buchvostov. He is the chairperson or president of Belarusian Free Metal Workers Union. And the last one here of our present, Sergei Antusevich, the vice president of the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions. And me is Oleg Podolinsky. I'm the international secretary for the DKDP. Mm. Thank you. We are happy to have you all present. Can you say something about your situation at the moment? Okay, so uh, since I'm the only one who can speak more or less fluent English, so my colleagues instructed me to, uh, to speak on their behalf and to act as a kind of a moderator you know, in our conversation. So I will start well telling you about the situation in, in Belarus now, now and then you will proceed with your questions. So, uh, maybe before, okay. Uh, now I would like briefly to, pre to present the situation at the moment uh, in Belarus and in Belarusian trade union movement. The situation in Belarus does not change in positive direction. On the contrary, it is worsening very rapidly, and uh, despite the general, general condemnation of the regime by the world community, the world community opinion is neglected by the regime. So, uh, the regime, having lost the presidential elections, began brutal repressions and violence uh, against the workers and came, who came out to the peaceful protest rallies and strikes. Hundreds of workers were sentenced to administrative arrest, received huge fines, were fired, and three of them were convicted to lengthy prison terms for participating in strike. The regime has completely winded down the social dialogue in the country. Pressure on independent unions and their members keeps on increasing. The newly created independent union organizations are denied registration and thus they are deprived of the opportunity to act as a, uh, as a union organization legally, to have mass events and to receive solidarity international uh, assistance. This is briefly what's going on now. So, and the, I know your case has been discussed uh, in the uh, ILO Standards Committee uh, the last days, uh, which hopefully will criticize Lukashenko deeply. Uh, what are you hoping for from the ILO? So, uh, yes, on the 7th of June, the Belarusian case was discussed in the Committee of Standards of the ILO conference, which was this, this year was, was carried, is being carried on online. So the bulky majority of speakers representing, representing, representing uh, governments and the workers' organizations, including the government of, of Norway and the trade unions of Norway, sharply criticized the, the government uh, of Belarus for violation of the Fundamental Convention 87 of the ILO. And they demanded to stop repressions and the violence against workers and their independent unions. We expect that the conclusion of the ILO Standard Committee will be quite tough and resolute, although we understand that the online ILO conference has some certain limitations. 
we do realize that any ILO uh, decision which will be taken by, uh, by, by the committee will not be, will not stop the Belarusian regime, which offered the people the unprecedented level of uh, violence and repressions instead of dialogue. Actually, the state of emergency has been declared in Belarus. Yeah. This is different from the, the, the ILO case of Belarus. You even have uh, got new laws recently or uh, will be implemented quite soon, which will make the situation even worse. Isn't that right? Yes, absolutely right. Well, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, maybe a week before the beginning of the ILO conference, well, very serious amendments have been uh, introduced into the labor code, very uh, crucially uh, worsening the, the the rights and in, the, the rights of workers and the trade unions. And also, uh, the day after the consideration of Belarusian case in the ILO, on the 8th of June, new amendments have been introduced to the criminal code of Belarus. Well, and uh, this, uh, the criminal code amendments sharply limit the rights of citizens and workers and entail criminal liability for any attempts to fight for their rights and freedoms. The amendments were made immediately after discussions of Belarus in the ILO, suggesting tougher criminal penalties for causing harm to the state. Thus, hard times await people of Belarus and the independence unions. But you are with us today because you are awarded the Arthur Svensson International Trade Union Rights uh, Prize. Could you tell us what the prize could mean to you or what it means to you? Will it help you in any way? besides the economic support? Well, uh, um, well, taking the opportunity now, uh, on behalf of all those people present here, we would like to, to thank uh, Norwegian unions, to thank the uh, committee of Arthur Svensson uh, Prize for awarding this, this prize to Belarusian in Congress of Democratic Trade Unions. <clears throat> we are really proud that we have received such a broad and overwhelming recognition in the international trade union movement. And Arthur Svensson's International Prize is the most prestigious award ever existed in the, in the world trade union movement. And for the BKDP and its members, the, the Svensson's International Prize is a moral award more than economic, economical. This is a solidarity support to the PKDP and its members. It gives our union and members strength and confidence in their struggle for the rights and interests of workers and for freedom and democracy. The workers and their unions realize that they are not alone in their struggle. They are fight against the tyranny and it gives them belief in their future victory. Thank you. I'm happy to hear this. Uh, we will now go on with the award ceremony in honor of you and your fight for the workers' rights in, in Belarus. Uh, it was very good to, to see you, to talk with you. Uh, and uh, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the ceremony. Uh, in honor of you. Um, thanks to Alexander and Oleg and all the other comrades. Uh, the fight goes on. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. With me now, I have 
two persons who have followed the situation in Belarus for years and who have been closely engaged with the independent unions of Belarus throughout this difficult period. It is uh, Anton Lepik. He is an executive secretary of the Pan-European Regional Council of the ITUC, a very long name. And it is Kemal Özkan, who is assistant general secretary of Industrial Global Union. Both Anton and Kemal are responsible within their organization for the region of former Soviet states, among others, Belarus. Uh, I'll start with you, Anton. Belarus is a former Soviet state that became independent about 30 years ago. But as I understand it, it has followed its own way when it comes to economic policy and working life compared to many other former Soviet states. For example, the large companies are owned by the state and there is relatively little foreign investments compared to most countries. Could you explain to us more on this matter um, and why Lukashenko has been able to be in power for so long time in spite of being called uh, Europe's last dictator? After all, he's, he has been quite popular, right? Yes, well, Belarus uh, didn't go through the same type of shock therapy like other countries of uh, Soviet bloc, or at least not to the extent that the other countries did. So it is like uh, the country was looking what is going on in uh, its neighborhood. So people saw devastating effects of the liberal reforms promoted by the international financial institutions. They saw the Wild West capitalism coming to this part of the world. And uh, the people voted for someone who promised a kind of uh, more socially oriented alternative to all of this. That's why he came into power in mid 90s. But also Belarus uh, has a very strategic geographical position. So it uh, had very specific role with big enterprises serving entire uh, Soviet bloc. Uh, it was a kind of uh, very um, stable position with, within what we would now name uh, supply chain. So it, is, it was about uh, uh, big enterprises uh, with uh, technology. So it was the final product that actually the Belarusian enterprises provided and all the other republics uh, of at least of the post -Sovi of, of Soviet Union were depending on all this. So when uh, he came into power, uh, of course, uh, Belarus uh, was uh, going through very difficult period of uh, economic uh, downturn because everything around was also in the downturn. But uh, he, he acted, he actually introduced what I would say a kind of a time freezing spell that worked for a certain period when the uh, environment around the country was uh, not too negative. So when uh, uh, enterprises when uh, in Russia were recovering, so beginning of this um, uh, century, Belarus was uh, kind of uh, catching up with what was lost in the 90s. But of course, this couldn't work for years. And uh, when the uh, circumstances uh, changed, this type of a system couldn't work anymore. He suppressed all the uh, all the opponents, all the freedoms, uh, all the people who can 
uh, introduce alternatives uh, to his uh, kind of uh, uh, way of uh, dealing with the economy. So it was just a question of time. This way of manual uh, handling of the economy that uh, worked during the uh, years of general growth around that cannot be sustainable in the long term. And as when the environment changed, well, the mistakes uh, started uh, bringing uh, end to the people's patience, if I could say it. Because something really changed last year before the election last autumn. W what, what happened? Well, I would, I see this in the perspective. I see that, uh, I would say that disillusionment with the Lukashenko and his uh, regime started long, long, long time before events of the last year. At least for us, for those who are following the situation in the country from the perspective of the workers' rights, there was uh, nothing really uh, new because actually Belarus was a kind of uh, uh, combination between plant and uh, market economy, taking the worst from the both. So the country uh, had state controlled enterprises where executives uh, were hostages of a mood of one person, where uh, uh, all the workers are on the short term contract system, uh, where the freedom to protest, to act in any way collectively was uh, dismissed and prosecuted. So, of course, for some periods uh, uh, when uh, people were comparing Belarus with some other countries around, they were saying, OK, but the wages are paid on time, the pensions are good, that the healthcare system was not destroyed or it was not privatized, that you don't need to pay for the uh, healthcare services. All this, of course, uh, was part of uh, his um, uh, approach. But for us, it was uh, the matter how he treated and he treats uh, his uh, people, the citizens of Belarus. And I would mention only three examples from the field that we are dealing with. And I'm sure there are much more examples from other fields. So first, I mentioned already the short-term contract system. It means that 95% of the workers, they are on uh, term based contracts, but that doesn't only mean that uh, the employer doesn't need to explain why the contract is not prolonged, for example. It also means that a worker cannot quit his employer, his or her employment without penalties because of this contract system. So it's a kind of perverse system of the short uh, of the uh, forced labor. And there was a culmination with this system several years ago when he installed by the decree in the wood processing uh, industry that actually no one can leave enterprise without permission of a governor of a region. So either if you want to leave, you can leave, but then you have to to be fired uh, as if you committed uh, a grave mistake. So people were actually uh, intentionally doing grave mistakes uh, not to, to get fired. Uh, the second was, the second ring bell was the decree on social parasitism. When uh, by decree, Actually, the head of the state uh, named 400,000 compatriots as parasites, as they were not contributing to the social security system. Either they were unemployed, technically unemployed, or they were in the formal economy, doesn't matter. So one out of 10 
of working people was named by the head of the state as a social parasite. It demonstrates how he treats the people, he treats the workers. And the last uh, uh, example was uh, actually related to COVID. When the COVID crisis started, he was the one that denied it. One of the few leaders of the states in the world that denied it. He even called for traditional Subotnik, you know, that uh, in the springtime, everyone has to go to street to help communal services to do its job, their job. So he called it with the usual way of mass mobilization, despite the risks of the COVID. And of course, the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare workers saw the results of this kind of uh, rejection of the uh, evident uh, risk and evident danger, and they were shut up by force. So, and they didn't shut up when they saw the police, uh, how the police has beaten uh, people in August. That's how it's all uh, actually uh, was triggered. So basically the political events, it was the last drop. It was the last drop when people saw that their voices are stolen, that they are actually have to risk their lives, not only their uh, well-being, but their lives. And they clearly demonstrated that they are fed up with someone who treats them as serfs. So that's what happened in uh, autumn last year. People just told that it's fed up. Right. They're fed up. Uh, during the protests, the trade unions became an active part through strikes and actions, which was a quite a new phenomenon as far as I know. Kemal, all the independent trade unions are, as I know, affiliated to Europe organization, Industrial Global Union. Could you first of all explain the trade union, trade union situation in Belarus for us? There are both unions controlled by Lukashenko and there are independent unions, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Espen. <clears throat> From historical perspective, independent unions were created even before the current regime in Belarus, but they were never allowed to live, grow up and work. And I recall the protests of miners in 1989 for wages, later in 1990 strike at Gomselmash demanding compensations for Chernobyl. And the current regime always wanted to keep the union movement under control. And in 1993, the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions, BKDP, was created. So the BKDP was formed by the unions which were born from the protests from that time. And industrial global unions, three affiliates, are the backbones of the BKDP namely BNP, RAP, and SPM. The fact is that uh, during recent protests, many workers have withdrawn from their memberships from the regime-connected unions, organizations, and moved to free and democratic uh, trade unions. With the start of uh, protests in August 2020, independent unions surely joined the protest actions. Their voice was heard, they took the lead, and a number of demands, including the requirement to abandon the system of short-term labor contra contracts was voiced in many rallies held at big enterprises. But the systemic denial to register independent unions and as Anton already mentioned, extended use of fixed term contracts to seek to eliminate the presence of um, independent union leaders and activists in all enterprises uh, uh, is the case. Since 2000, 
at least a hundred of independent union organizations were denied registration out there. Let me give you an example. In August last year, 200 workers joined the newly established local union branch of Belarusian Independent Union BNP in a steel company. The union was denied for registration and all the activities who initiate uh, activists to initiate the creation of the union were dismissed. Three activists were sentenced to three years in jail for a strike at the same time, uh, uh, at the same company in August 2020. And many other workers were subject to administrative arrests. The BNP union reported at least two other denials of registration in 2020. Another affiliate of industrial SPM, the Free Trade Union of Metal Workers, reported that in a way of mass layoffs in Minsk, over 100 union members were fired from at least five companies for joining the union of their choice between November 2020 to February 2021. And Police forces raided the offices of another independent union, the Belarusian Radio and Electronic Industry Workers Union, RAP, on uh, 16th of February, earlier this year, seizing everything they could get their hands on, including uh, the personal money of staff members, union property, communication devices, <laughs> union documents and campaign materials, and the government officials refused to give a copy of the search record or to supply an inventory of the seized items. Actually, uh, these issues have been raised uh, at the International Labour Organization over the last 20 years. After the election or during the period after the elections, we heard or read a lot about strikes and demonstrations uh, with the workers taking part in the in the movement against Lukashenko. How, how important was it for the democratic movement that the trade unions engaged, do you think, Kamal? Uh, Espen, look, um, surely there has been and there is still a broad scale of the strike movement, not just limited to trade union action. In the first days after the August elections and the mass dispersals of uh, protesters, meetings were held at many enterprises where workers clearly expressed their political assessments and distrust of the officially announced results of the presidential elections. However, after that, the workers in most industrial enterprises returned to their jobs. Belarusians are a very low abiding people and possibly the arguments of employers who stated that the demands of the um, uh, for Lukashenko's resignation are not within their competence, but they fulfill all the points of collective agreements played their role and the protest went from enterprises to the streets, also manifesting itself in the form of self-organization of people in courtyards and the areas. At the same time, in many industrial enterprises, young workers formed independent trade union organizations and came to our affiliates, which they previously knew about, Unfortunately, the authorities are now politicizing any form of self-organization and collective action, even in workplaces and on issues of protection, payment and organization of work. And this makes it difficult for independent unions to work, to grow up in enterprises. A working democracy balances the needs of people with order and representative control this requires a political infrastructure for making sure that all voices be heard. A true democracy must respect conflicting opinions, encourage debate and honor the opinions of its citizens. 
This requires participation of citizens with uh, engagement uh, with the civic organizations. The democracy does not mandate involvement, but instead empowers citizens to participate. And voting in elections is a critical right and privilege that represents democratic participation. And protection of rights is critical for a democracy, ensuring rights for each citizen. And a democracy must allow varied opinions recognized. And rule of law, fair trial are important legs of a genuine democracy. And what we see is that these infrastructures, baselines for a democracy in Belarus are inexistent. So if a democratic society is to be in place in Belarus, it can only be possible with civil society, particularly with free and democratic trade unions. If we want a democratic country, it is critically important that economy is democratized for which trade unions are essential actors and independent unions in Belarus have a historical role in this regard and the global union movement is completely aligned with them, providing all the support on solidarity for a democratic Belarus in the near future. Hmm. I, I'll jump to a, to a last question to, to both of you. Uh, I will not ask for predictions for the future, uh, but it has struck me when it comes to the independent trade unions they are small, they are compared to the official unions, uh, they are rather, rather few, and all unions today are affiliated to just one of the global unions, as far as I know, uh, industrial. Is there something in progress when it comes to other important groups of workers, for example, health workers, teachers, journalists, and transport workers, which very often are large groups we see being important in the fight for workers' rights in other countries. The question goes to both of you. Well, I think that the interest to joining independent unions is uh, high as, as it uh, never was. So I think that in all these sectors, we see people who are looking towards independent trade unions as a mechanism, as means to ensure that their democratic freedoms rights are restored in this country. Of course, for years, uh, you are right that the uh, independent trade unions which are part of the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions were mainly concentrated in the bigger enterprises of the industrial sector. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that there are, uh, there are no other groups in other sectors. Actually, uh, the high schools were from the very beginning of the 90s were active. I mean, the teachers, the professors were active there. The one of the first uh, strikes actually uh, uh, in, the, in the independent Belarus was organized by workers of the Minsk Metropolitan underground. So there were also unions, uh, for example, air traffic controllers unions, very prominent and strong union. But of course, these were the unions that uh, uh, unfortunately, we're not able to continue acting in the legal field because the legal field was so much restricted. And uh, these were the unions that were destroyed by the regime. Uh, but what we see now, we see now that people are coming to independent unions. Teachers, professors uh, of universities, uh, when the students were reprimanded or expelled from the universities because they took uh, part in the street actions, these teachers were trying to protect their students and they were targets 
of the administration of the high schools because it's also part of the system. And these people try to set up unions, independent unions. They applied for, even applied for the uh, registration. Of course, they were denied by the regime. And Kemal explains that the regime is extremely afraid of uh, uh, setting up and legalizing the independent unions. In the healthcare sector, in the healthcare sector, when uh, doctors, when uh, nurses saw the beaten people from the streets and they tried to voice their concerns about what they saw, these people were uh, forced to silence. Even there was a situation when one of the doctors was sentenced for the prison because of the death of the demonstrator, and not those who were actually responsible for beating of a person, of an activist, but a doctor who was put as a, a responsible for uh, for uh, treatment or non-correct, etc., treatment, which was absolutely absurd. So these people also started looking towards independent trade unions. Their attempts were denied, but there is uh, there are people who are actually even without legalization they are asserting their collective interest in healthcare sector there is the union which is panacea union which is not registered but which is acting and even uh, forcing the um, healthcare institutions to take their opinion into account so there are signals and also from the transport sector from the it workers uh, uh, from even uh, from the sectors which normally are not that uh, well uh, unionized, like financial or banking sector, etc., there are signals that uh, the interest towards independent unions is extremely high. And it is not about the numbers of the legalized and registered uh, unions, it's about the number of people who actually ready to join the union when the time comes they are ready to be part of trade union movement without announcing it or the bravest ones even announcing it and it is uh, very important for civil protest today for trade union movement today but it's extremely uh, important for tomorrow when the people of belarus take their country back from the group of people that uh, took uh, it years ago. So it would be very challenging task also for independent trade unions to make sure that the economic, social, democratic reforms which follow this would take into account workers, their interests, that uh, the lessons learned from uh, some other countries around uh, Belarus would be taken into account in the economic and social policy development processes. And indeed, most important, that trade unions would be part of this national economic and social policy development process. This day will come. This day will come. And as as in the situation of today, where we as international trade union movement are providing support to our colleagues in their fight for democracy, we will be providing support to them to make sure that these interests are being included and represented in the national uh, economic and social development policies processes. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time here, but uh, Kemal, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I just wanted a couple of things, uh, Espen. Indeed, uh, uh, three independent unions uh, are members of Industrial Global Union, but one of them, BNP, is also a member of uh, other global unions in um, agriculture and transport uh, uh, sectors. And indeed, the, um, the membership figures are uh, low, but uh, their influence, their importance is uh, quite big. Otherwise, the government would never put such attention over these independent unions. And uh, these unions, unlike official ones, practically don't have any opportunity to register new organizations. Previously, this was uh, 
uh, hampered by difficulties for independent trade unions to obtain from the employer the so-called legal address without which the authorities refuse to register trade unions. Over the past 20 years, independent unions have been able to register only one of their organizations. After August 2020, the initiators of the formation of independent trade unions are summoned to talk with ideologists at enterprises, and they are subject to psychological pressure and dismissals. And uh, the, 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 the system of short-term contracts against which industrial has been campaigning for many years is an additional lever of control over workers since with uh, activists, they simply do not extend labor contra contracts that are concluded in Belarus, usually for one year. Naturally, under such conditions, the number of independent unions is low, although the number of workers who support the values of independent unions is much larger than their current number. And Anton has already identified the areas of new independent union uh, uh, improvement, particularly the fourth uh, uh, affiliate of EKDP, Free Trade Union of Belarus. They played a role and organized uh, different uh, the other groups and, uh, uh, in different sectors. In fact, during the autumn protest, in, in each initiative groups of health workers and teachers appeared, which became part of SPP. In addition, IT workers approached the leadership of PKDP with a proposal to create an online trade union, and currently workers can join this online trade union directly on the PKDP website. So, Industry or Global Union will continue to support our free and democratic trade union affiliates with capacity building, with training, organizing new members in enterprises, and then we will continue to be their voice vis-a-vis -vis multilateral organizations as well as multinational companies, particularly with those ha uh, having business relations in uh, Belarus. And using this opportunity, I would like to congratulate uh, you, uh, Espan, your organization, for granting this Arthur Swenson hour to our Belarusian sisters and brothers. I believe it is an important motivation for them to keep the flag of struggle in their country. And I also want to thank and congratulate you for your great support, particularly in uh, communicating with the uh, customer companies uh, having business relations uh, in Belarus. The struggle continues, and then we will make sure that there will be a democratic and viable and livable Belarus with the efforts of uh, trade union movement. We cross our fingers. Thanks to, to both of you for sharing your knowledge and, and views uh, with us. You are both now participating in the ILO conference where Belarus, together with Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, I think, are so-called well. double footnoted cases, which means the country gravely violates labor rights, which underlines the importance of supporting the independent trade unions and the workers in Belarus, I think. Thank you very much. This uh, session we have called, Should I Stay or Should I Go? When workers' rights and other human rights are attacked, companies often face dilemmas, especially if they want to behave like a decent uh, company. Whether it be Belarus, Myanmar or Hong Kong these days, companies face dilemmas. Should they withdraw and stop doing business? Or should they um, rather stay and keep the workplaces safe for the workers? There are a lot of dilemmas around this issue, and they are not easy. But companies face them again and again, 
and therefore it's important to discuss both within the trade unions and within the company. When it comes to Belarus, the Norwegian large fertilizer company Yara had to face these issues. And Yara has also been met with demands to withdraw from parts of the opposition, to stop doing business in Belarus immediately. And therefore, we have with us the CEO of Yara, Tore Holsetter, and we have the global trade union representative Geir Sundbø to discuss this dilemma. And we're also very happy to have with us Lisaveta Merliak, who is secretary of the independent trade union uh, BITU in uh, Belarus. Um, before we discuss the dilemma, uh, Sven Tore, could you briefly explain why Yara is doing business in Belarus and how important this is for Lukashenko? Well, um, Yara is one of the biggest uh, fertilizer companies in the, in the world and we have um, operations in, in 60 countries and we, we sell and source from 160 countries over all over the world. Um, and when it comes to, to, to fertilizer, it's, uh, it's really three main nutrients. It's uh, nitrogen, um, that's 78% of the air that we breathe so that we can uh, uh, source from, uh, from anywhere in the, in, in the world. And then you have phosphate and, and potash that are uh, mined from the, from the ground. And uh, uh, phosphate is, is also um, fairly widely distributed throughout uh, the world, but potash is much more uh, concentrated. Uh, indeed, um, uh, more than 80% of the total production in the world uh, is done by, by four companies. And, uh, and uh, with us being one of the, the biggest buyers of uh, potash, we, we seek to expand our, our footprint and source from multiple uh, sources. And, uh, and then um, uh, Belarus uh, is, uh, is, is one of the countries where we, we source this from. And, and that's a major export um, out of Belarus as well. So you are a large customer of Belarus Kali, perhaps the most important one? It, it, we, we could be. Uh, and uh, when, when you look at the size of our, uh, our purchases, uh, we're, we're number two or number three in the world in terms of uh, sourcing, but then we're uh, being compared with, with nations. So, so as a company, we're the biggest uh, sources, uh, sourcer of uh, potash in the world. And Belarus Gali is important for the Lukashenko regime. It's, it's one of the biggest um, uh, exports uh, out of Belarus. Yeah. Uh, during the uprising last autumn, there was a strike and there were demonstrations at Belarus Gali, and there were demands that Yara should uh, stop doing business with the company. Uh, Geir, you pre represent the workers of, uh, of Yara. What did you do when this situation arose? Um, I was in contact with uh, independent trade unions, first of all, Lisaveta, since uh, 2019. And for me, uh, it was always important what they wanted, because if they wanted us to leave, uh, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, for us to, to stay in Belarus. So um, we discussed this, Tor and I, and we quickly agreed that uh, what, what was the right thing to do. And uh, with the support from Lisa Veta and the others, uh, we decided to, to, to go on with this business. But uh, with, uh, should we say, uh, more, uh, maybe more focus on the, um, internal things in Belarus College, like uh, uh, health, safety, these kind of issues. Um, uh, we went to we went to Belarus in September, and uh, he had meetings with uh, Belarus Colony Management. I had meetings with the uh, trade unions, both of them, and uh, in Solihorsk. And uh, when we uh, went back to the airport before we left, we had also meetings with B2, Elisaveta and the others, and and some members from the Belarus Colony Strike Committee. 
um, we were in frequent contact during the fall. And um, I also have to say that uh, the support from the trade unions in Yara all over the world has been massive. They are all supporting what we have done and what we still do. And uh, we see BKDP and B2 as very important stakeholders. Mm. I think you acted in an exemplary way, uh, Guy, when you contacted the independent trade union uh, in, in, in Belarus. And you also arranged meetings, including the, the CEO of, 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 of Yara. And you have had established a close dialogue uh, after this. I have to say, they contacted me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, we also have with us Lisaveta Meriliak from B2, the independent trade union, which has approximately two and a half thousand members in Belarus, <coughs> I think. Uh, Lisaveta, could you explain to us shortly what happened in the company after the elections last autumn? Okay. Yeah. Um, what happened after the elections uh, in August? Um, there were a couple of days of uh, extreme violence in the streets, while police and uh, special police uh, forces squads uh, were arresting people and beating them and putting them to prison. So the workers were the first, actually, who said that it's enough. It's enough, and that this violence should be stopped. And a massive uh, uprising of uh, work has happened all over the country. And actually, Belarus Kali was not the first enterprise that started this uh, talking about striking. Um, uh, however, uh, the full square, uh, central square of uh, Sedigorsk was uh, filled with people, with workers. And uh, uh, Belarus Kali workers uh, are about uh, 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 around 20% uh, of the population of the, of the city. So all workers were in the streets and they wanted to talk to, uh, to the head of the company actually, because the company uh, is a state-owned enterprise, meaning that they wanted to see the representative of the state, uh, Ivan Galavati actually, because he's also a member of uh, uh, cabinet of ministers and uh, you know, a very high positioned uh, official. Um, uh, so uh, they said that uh, they won't start work until this violence stops. Um, and actually, they were collecting signatures, um, signatures of the employees of uh, Belarus Kali. Um, and uh, the strike committee says that it is about 6,000 uh, workers out of 17,000 uh, who signed uh, the demands of the strike committee. And the demands were political ones. They were, uh, they, they were to, to have new fair elections, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to punish those who, uh, who uh, used violence against peaceful protesters, and there were four demands actually. Um, but all of, them, all of those demands were political. Uh, however, um, uh, the, strike, uh, the strike at Belarus Kali took about uh, a day or two days, and um, uh, the, the management of the company and the state and the police, they, all, uh, uh, they, they made uh, uh, everything possible to make workers come back to work. Um, they said that the strike, this type of strike was illegal, and so uh, people started to think that, well, maybe we should return to work and then do something there. So the, there was an Italian strike. We call it Italian, but Italians don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, it's a strike which is called go slow or uh, work to rule. Um, many people started to work so slowly that uh, practically no work uh, had been done at the enterprise. Um, uh, several mines stopped actually. Um, and uh, what happened next was a uh, uh, return to repressions again. Uh, all workers who uh, who were not present at work, uh, who joined the kind of the, the, the strike, uh, even for one hour, they were punished. They were punished uh, by um, uh, taking away all the possible bonuses uh, from their payments. And that means that they worked for for 
for the salary, but the salary is uh, not that good without all those bonuses. And um, those who formed the strike committee, uh, they were 23 people. Uh, they were immediately, um, uh, the management of the company tried to immediately dismiss them. Uh, however, it was not possible in case uh, uh, in case of the first mine because uh, uh, many of those who joined the strike committee they were elected as, uh, elected uh, union representatives and according to uh, the collective agreement it is not possible to fire uh, elected uh, uh, union representatives without consent of the of the union so the union refused independent union refused to to agree. Uh, on their dismissals, and uh, they've been dismissed just uh, in uh, late April this year. Um, uh, so uh, what we saw uh, was uh, uh, this return to repressions, and we tried to use a mechanism that we heard about, but we never tried it before. Uh, from our previous research done in 2019, uh, we got to know that Yara was a big uh, customer of Belaruskali, and uh, of course, we researched. Uh, 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 we made a research about Yara and found out the code of conduct, which was translated in uh, 15 or 16 languages, which was amazing for us, for me, <laughs> for example. It was in Russian, actually. So uh, that was the. Um, in 2019, we were already trying to contact uh, Yara, but uh, uh, we didn't finish this uh, kind of uh, uh, communication. Uh, and uh, in 2020, in late August, it was uh, clear that we have to address Yara. Uh, have to address Yara to ask it to um, uh, interfere. So we did. And uh, with the communication between me and Ger, um, uh, there started to be this whole uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Uh there were and still are parts of the opposition who demands that Yara should break all ties with Belarus Gali. Uh, this discussion has been renewed quite recently after the hi hijacking of the airplane a few weeks ago. Uh, mm -hmm. What has been the union's view on this issue? Should Yara stay or should they leave Belarus? I will start with the official position of uh, of my union and the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions, um, um, uh, expressed by the chairperson of my union, Maxim Vazniakov. Uh, he says that Yara makes very big efforts to restore the human, the workers, and the union rights. And what is really important uh, uh, to improve uh, occupational health and safety at the enterprise. And what matters is that uh, Yara is aiming to do even more. So we ask Yara to go on while it is still possible. It is still possible because uh, the sanctions are not uh, <laughs> not there yet. Um, uh, however, uh, uh, when talking about sanctions um, and uh, this hijacking of the plane uh, gave the second chance for the opposition in exile to to start talking again about sanctions. Uh, so. Um, we represent, we are the union um, uh, which is represented exactly at the enterprises which will be under sanctions. This is a petrochemical industry and mining. Uh, so we are in a situation uh, that when uh, it is not possible uh, to live without sanctions, but, but at the same time, it's not possible to, uh, it, it is very hard to, to be under sanctions because this is, uh, the workplaces for, for our members, you know, and for workers. Uh, so, um, uh, in any case, um, uh, if uh, if there are sanctions or if there are no sanctions, uh, the independent union will suffer. So, we need to find the third way, kind of. And, uh, um, well, this third way is uh, having Yara, for example, yeah. Uh, the third way is uh, uh, to have... Um, a very firm position of the International Labour Organization on uh, violations of workers' rights and, the, and uh, union rights in the country, uh, uh, union solidarity all over the world. Uh, this, uh, the, the union solidarity is something that uh, only workers have. And um, 
uh, in our case, um, uh, uh, we ask all the unions uh, that have contact with us to support our position and to stay with us till the end. I hope there won't be an unhappy end, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, to have a common position on one and the same issue. And uh, when uh, uh, also uh, when there started to be um, uh, when uh, when um, when there were um, sanctions again uh, in in mind, um, uh, first of all, we believe that sanctions will hit the workers, um, and um, unfortunately, and um, 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 We believe that uh, if the enterprise uh, loses money uh, due to sanctions, uh, it will try to uh, cut uh, either cut uh, spending on occupational health and safety, or it will cut the, the workforce. And we have two and a half uh, thousand workers there at Belarusskali, so. Uh, I believe that if they need to lay off someone, they will try to lay off someone who is a member of the independent union. So it's a really hard situation that we are in. Um, and uh, we see that it is not uh, fast and it is not easy uh, to negotiate uh, those important issues such as human rights, workers' rights, union rights violations with the state-owned company. Um, like we mean the restoration of uh, strikers at work or return of bonuses that many workers lost after participating in, in those uh, one day strikes. Uh, and equal attitude to both unions operating at Belarus Kali, that is very that is very important. And improvement of occupational safety and health of the enterprise. These things are very hard and very uh, long term um, can be solved only in a long term uh, dialogue between two companies. So it is like um, you know, we we are short of time and we need this time. And uh, there are still many outstanding requirements and uh, questions. And uh, we really need to do more uh, and to put more effort uh, into this uh, campaign, kind of. Yeah. Basically, your view is that for your members, sake of your members, you think Yara sh still should should stay in, in Belarus yeah, and, and do the best out of it. Still, there are yeah. some who demand that Yara should quit its business in, in, in Belarus. Sven Tore, uh, have you in any way changed views on these, uh, on these questions throughout uh, the last year? And do you have any advice to companies in the same position as you? For sure, it, it, it's, it's a very challenging um, situation. And mm. uh, uh, but at the same time, we, we have a way of working in uh, in the other when it comes to, to to safety, when it comes to ethics and compliance, and, and also the business partner code of conduct uh, that Lisaveta referred to. The, these are uh, universal. It, it uh, it's valid everywhere we uh, we, we operate. And then uh, you know, being in as many countries as we are, it's uh, we are confronted with a lot of dilemmas. But but key then is, is is to try to educate ourselves and to understand the the situation. And uh, in, in that regard, we work like we like we always do. In in, in the other, this is a joint effort together with the with the union. Uh, and uh, trying to understand the situation as, as well as possible. And, I, and something that I try to be aware of is, you know, by, by the time information reaches me, it, it could have been filtered and, and, and I don't get the right information, but to get the first hand uh, information, the direct dialogue with the unions has been, been key. And uh, since um, August, uh, Guy and, and Lisaveta, I believe they, Spoken with each other every day, uh, several times a day, and I speak with Gary every day, uh, and, and that helps me to understand uh, better the, the the situation, so that we can put measures in in place and be very clear on our demands uh, as a as a sourcer of, uh, of of product, but also be direct and 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 hopefully through that have direct positive uh, impact. And we've seen that uh, you know that there have been too many 
too many accidents. Uh, the, the safety records are not at the level they they, sh they should be. We made that very clear. And 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 uh, but but uh, it's not only about making statements in, in that regard. So so now we've actually uh, sent uh, one of our uh, Yara safety specialists to Solygorsk uh, to 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 work on on the ground to to help to to, to get the information <laughs> and to to deal with it and and, and hopefully through that uh, improve the, the the situation. But I, but I, I do believe through dialogue, uh, we, we, we have a fairly good uh, understanding of what is happening, of course, uh, not the same as being uh, physically on, on, on the ground, but, uh, but, but we do get a lot of uh, information and, and we try to, to, to use that to, 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 to sharpen our messaging, to sharpen our demands. Uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully over, over time, we will see results coming out of, of that. But it's this dialogue both with the unions and with the um, uh, independent unions in Belarus, uh, here in Norway, of course, we have a constant dialogue, but also internationally and with the uh, Norwegian Helsinki Committee, with the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I, I, I try to do my best to get an overview of the um, situation and, and, and uh, behave accordingly. But, uh, but I also have respect for the fact that I'm, I'm sitting here and in Oslo, I'm far away from where it's uh, happening. So, so the um, the information that I get is uh, is really helping me in in making these decisions. Hmm. I understand it's a tight and uh, ongoing dialogue between all the the relevant parts here. Geir, uh, this has obviously also been a very difficult uh, issue for uh, for you and the Norwegian trade union. What would happen that could make you change your mind and recommend that Yara should quit its business with Belarus Kali and leave Belarus? Uh, first, I want to mention something Elisaveta touched upon, uh, these uh, possible sanctions that will be possibly tightened and stronger. Uh, Yara is not the only company who is doing business in Belarus. There are a lot of other famous companies like uh, Pirelli, Michelin, Goodyear, British American Tobacco, Ikea, Siemens, a lot of other companies. But uh, uh, they don't receive any critics on social media or media in general like Yara does. And of course, it's very convenient for these companies to, to let Yara take the, um, all the critics. Because for them, it's business as usual. And they have little or no dialogue with the independent trade unions like we have. They are just doing business in the, what do you say, after dark. <laughs> um, so, uh, of course, if the European Union and or USA put on strong sanctions hitting fertilizer or Yara, we would have to follow that, of course. That's a, that's a no deal. But um, I think that as long as... Uh, and also another thing, <clears throat> uh, we have seen that um, uh, Lisa Veta also touched upon it, that the independent trade union and the other union is treated differently sometimes. And this is not acceptable. And uh, I think we can just imagine how that picture would be if you are left Belarus. Because we are pointing out this every time we are told about this uh, in the discussions between Yara and Belarus Kali. So I think that uh, if if my friends in, in, in the independent trade units should change their mind completely, I think that would be the only reason for me. Hmm. So, uh, to sum up, in a way, the basics here is to establish a good dialogue between the trade unions in Belarus and, and Norway, and also to establish a good dialogue, including the, the management of, of, of the company, of course. Um, and in the end, for you as a trade union representative to follow the advice of um, of B2 in, in, in Belarus. They know best.
Okay, thank you all three of you, Lisaveta, Geir, and uh, Sven Tore. Uh, with this, um, this year's ceremony is over. So I will thank both the participants for taking part, and of course you, the viewers. We will make the ceremony available for everybody afterwards to, 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 to watch for those who are not able to, to take part to watch it directly. And to round off, I will give you the wonderful Norwegian singer Ingrid Ulava. Thank you all. Så har du sett ondskapen av